You're welcome. Yeah, I'm literally sure. just doing the sponsor slide. Yeah. Um, so you'll have seen this slide plenty of times if you've been in sessions. We genuinely cannot do these events without sponsors. So much as I'm not a corporate kind of guy, you've got to thank the sponsors because seriously, they're the reason we can get here. Um, for those who kind of don't know me, which really, uh, there's only one person in this room that really hasn't had a proper introduction to me so far. Uh, my name's Mike Hartley, I'm a consultant at Enhance. We do work, well, the work I do is predominantly with not for profit sectors. Um, I'm a Dynamics 365 Power Platform Specialist. Um, I'm also known as Heart of the Midlands, which is my personal brand. Um, I. Yeah, I have to kind of, that, that's so new that I squeak when I walk. Um, and I'm a, I'm a really vocal advocate for accessibility, for mental health, for diversity, inclusion, for all of the things that the podcast, which I founded and co-present, the things we don't talk about, stuff don't actually talk about or consider. Um, and I am a cheerleader for the community without the miniskirt because <laughs> put that image in your head. Go on, I dare you. Uh, no, please don't. Yeah. There's my links. Um, you can scan the QR code to find me, but um, my journey into accessibility. Before I kind of go through, you might look at me and think, okay, I can't see anything kind of physical in there. He says losing his balance. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very, 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 very bluntly open and honest about my mental health struggles and challenges. But I have a degenerative spine disorder. I've had major surgery on my neck. So, weird fact, the normal human neck hinges at the bottom of the neck. So when you bend your neck, you're actually bending from your shoulders. My neck, because I've actually got a solid metal neck now, I hinge from up at the top. If I think about that, that is the weirdest thing going, because it's really bizarre. Because when people say, put your chin on your chest, I can't. I, I genuinely cannot actually get my chin on my chest. It freaks me out. Last year, I actually got rushed into A&E, because... Part of my spine had uh, dislodged, it decayed, dislodged, and it had dropped down to what's called the cauda equina. It sits right at the bottom of your spine and it's a cluster of nerves that controls everything in your body from waist down. I was within one millimeter of completely losing everything from the waist down. I had neck surgery 11, 12 years ago, I lose track of time. They told me that within 10 years, my neck will start degenerating again because all it did was, it was kind of preventative delay. I've actually had problems from year five onwards. My lower spine, they didn't expect my lower spine to go, they thought it was so for me, accessibility is a scary thing because for me, it could mean quadriplegia. 
But anyway, somebody in this room knows this one very well. My journey into accessibility itself started in a pub. This wonderful person here and their mother. We were chatting and I got told a simple change and I'm going to tell you about that. I then volunteered to help out at the Scottish Summit 2020 and Mark Christie asked me if I'd head up accessibility and I was like, well, I've never blogged about it, never talked about it, but hey, yeah, of course I'll do it. Why, why wouldn't I? I started to have conversations with people and developed an open mind to it because I thought it's a subject I don't know about because I've resisted it. Let's understand it. Trying things for myself. One of the biggies for me this year is trying to use keyboard navigation instead of using a mouse. I used to do it when I first started in IT because I came from a DOS background. So I used to use keyboard more than mouse because I was a keyboard jockey. But we've got so mouse oriented. It's scary when you try that. And then I've started to actually move along to actually building solutions. I've been talking about this now for two years. I'm actually now at a point where I'm thinking, I can start building things. I can start building solutions and proposing answers. I'm realizing, I'm never stopping, the journey's gonna continue. Now, I have to give you a warning. I am going to be very blunt on this topic. I really am. But there are good and positive things lying ahead. The reason I'm blunt, in some ways it's shock factor, but also, and to be honest with you, with this audience, I don't think I actually need to quite have the shock factor that I would in some audiences. Some audiences, you need the shock factor to make them just open their minds. Um, so, thankfully looking at you all, I don't think I quite need to be quite that way, but I will be. So, <clears throat> a question. When we deliver solutions to our customers, to our users, why isn't accessibility not a core part of it? Some of the answers, when I've questioned this, nobody asks for it. Okay, true. Nobody at wherever needs it. Because people automatically think wheelchair. We didn't know that we could or we should be building it. It's too time consuming. It's too difficult. And it is way too costly and we don't have the budget for it. Well, in the nicest possible way, all of those are wrong. They are completely wrong. Let's go back. Time consuming. It's all about forming habits. If you get habits in place, putting accessibility into things takes no extra time really. Certainly not when you're starting out on the journey, but then as you build the habits up and you progress on your journey, it's a core part and it doesn't become time consuming. And, and the example I'm going to give you is so, so simple, you'll realise just how ridiculously simple it is and not time consuming. It's too difficult. No, it's not. Form the habits. Find out about it, learn about it, get the habits in. Costly, no budget. No, it's not. It's all about habits. Genuinely, those bottom three are all about forming habits. If you've got it in that your habits are that I do things in a certain way, I name my power apps, screens and components in a certain way so that screen readers can use them, you get in the habit of that, it's not time consuming because we rename our controls anyway because we're all good people and we don't leave them as button one, button two, button three. <laughs> of course we don't. Well, that's 
habit forming, it doesn't take any time, it's not at any cost, and it's not difficult to do. It's just forming a habit. Nobody asks about it, because we don't talk about it. Customers don't ask us about it because we don't necessarily, they don't necessarily know we can actually deliver it. Because we never talk about it. Honestly, I have been at a workshop with a client, and it was one of the most horrific moments being a consultant I've had. We had a really important workshop, and one of the key stakeholders turned up in a wheelchair. The meeting room that we had was up two floors, and there was no lift. This key stakeholder was an employee of this charity. They couldn't be part of it. The reason being was because the ground floor meeting room was being used for a team meeting, and they didn't want to move. A key stakeholder was excluded because no shift. Nobody at company needs it. UN statistics state that diagnosed, there are 15% of the world population who need accessibility tools in some form or another. 20% is an unofficial estimate figure of how many people there are in total, including those who are not officially diagnosed as needing accessibility tools. One in five people that you know at least will need an accessibility tool of some form. It's a sobering thought when you think that a fifth of your user base is potentially excluded by not delivering an accessible solution. We didn't know we could, should be building it. I'm sorry, but I, I, I cannot answer that one because I just think in this day and age with the voices that we've got in the media and the legislation that's around and everything else. We might not understand what accessibility is, but we should at least know we should be considering it. So, right, where am I on time? Okay. Um, I want to give you some emotional content if this is going to work. And I don't know if it's going to. Oh, am I not on the Wi-Fi? Oh. No, you're not going to load. Ah, oh. all right. That's actually probably, considering where I've just come from, it's probably a good idea. Piece of homework for you. Go and look up the YouTube videos for the Xbox Adaptive Controller. I cannot watch it without crying when I'm on my own at home. You see a bunch of kids, physical disabilities, who've never been able to game on the same level as their friends. And Microsoft developed an, an adaptive kit for the Xbox that they can plug in their own type of controls to suit their own disabilities, and they can play. Oh my word. And that's driven from the top. That's driven from Satya Nadella himself. Because he has a child. I want to say cerebral palsy, and I'm pretty sure it is, but that might just mean me. And he's driven that. And that's part of the reason Microsoft have actually got a big accessibility push. Because it's coming right from the top. But it doesn't have to be something as complex as an adaptive controller. Microsoft recently announced they are launching the Surface Adaptive Kit. It's a bunch of stickers for a laptop. 
That's all it is. We don't know the price yet, but I'm really hoping it's going to be super cheap. The idea is that somebody who can't always necessarily see, they can put these stickers against ports on a laptop or on certain keys to help them find. Because I'm a touch typist most of the time, but I find that the bumps on the F and the J key they are getting so ridiculously you small. I, I just think if you switch between laptops, I think I, I switch between laptops regularly. I think I skip stickers on the way USB ports and HDMI ports are. Exactly. So I get confused. Yeah, exactly. That's it. I'm thinking I'm going to get one of these to stick on my laptop. Because, and on my, I mean, I've got a Microsoft Natural Ergonomic Keyboard. I'm going to get a set to stick on there to help me find, because even on the Ergonomic Keyboard, it's a new one. And the bumps have got smaller. Mm -hmm. I cannot find them easily, and I am mistyping. <laughs> but let's talk about the small change. Have a look at these hashtags. <laughs> hmm. Is this what your eyes saw? Yeah. Or your brains interpreted? simple capital letter in a hashtag to separate words, screen readers can actually tell the difference between the words. I didn't know that because whenever you see hashtags advertised by Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, they always promote them all lowercase. When you're typing in a hashtag on LinkedIn, it always comes lowercase because that's what everybody uses. Never given it another thought until that person there uh, told me about it and told me about screen readers. And I went away and I thought that is a simple change that all of a sudden makes my social media content and my professional social media content, if you can still count LinkedIn as that, it makes it all of a sudden a lot more accessible to, well, I didn't know it at the time, but 15 to 20 percent people. And let's be honest, it's a lot easier for anybody who doesn't need accessibility tools to understand what I've put. Because some of those you look at and you go, hold on, what do you actually mean by that hashtag? I went away, it took me two weeks of me focusing on my hashtags to make sure that I did not miss one. Then after that two weeks, it was a habit. That was two years ago. Cool, well, I mean. <laughs> and I'll be honest, the amount of times that I have not used capitalized hashtags, even if I'm using a single word in a hashtag, I capitalize the first letter. That's how habit forming has become. I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've slipped up, and that's usually because I'm tired or I'm emotional and I'm typing just probably stuff I shouldn't actually be typing at the time. The thing is, there's help at hand. It's not something that we need to look at and go, oh crap, we're screwed, I don't know where to begin, I don't know what to do. World Wide Web Consortium. Did you know that it's actually quicker to say World Wide Web than it is to say WWW? I found that fascinating fact, but that's by the by. World Wide Web Consortium, they have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines rolls off the tongue. <laughs> they are their set of standards for. That music's really starting to bug me, excuse me. Um, they have a set of web guidelines for building accessible websites. It's kind of becoming an industry standard for building digital content full stop, whether it's a digital presentation, 
a Word document, or a Power App, or a Power BI report. It's kind of the definition. The guidelines themselves are typical W3C guidelines. They are long-winded, they are overly wordy, they are boring as hell, but thankfully there are plenty of web accessibility websites out there that break it down into very simple to understand English. Office has an accessibility checker. How many people here use it all the time? Oh! I know I'm talking to the right one. I don't... I will quickly demo it because some people don't realise it's there. And actually, Microsoft, up until September, <coughs> had to actively turn it on. On Office 365 and the new Office 2019 suite they've released, for people who haven't got a subscription, it is enabled by default. It's a very small change, but it actually has a huge impact. And at the bottom of your documents, you will see accessibility, good to go, or investigate. Very simple. But it then tells you, I will show you. And talk to people. Not about us without us is the phrase that I've... I've heard uh, somebody shortened it to not without us. I feel in some ways an imposter standing here as somebody who doesn't use screen readers and who doesn't use some of those tools talking about accessibility. But the reason I'm having to do it is because sometimes the people that do don't like to talk about it, don't feel they can talk about it or don't get the platform to talk about it. I'm loud enough and brash enough and just in your face enough to actually say, you're giving me a slot and I'm talking about this because if you're not, seriously, what's wrong with you? And genuinely, I will actually say that to people because for me, this is a topic that's so important. We've got to get out there. We've got to be talking about this. Government websites and public sector websites have to be accessible. But have to be accessible. It's legislation. It's law. The chances are that, and, and they're talking about making it that all business websites have to be. If we produce professional content as bloggers or what have you, okay, we don't fall under the legal. But actually, we should be as well, because let's be honest, how often in our day jobs as consultants, looking at consultants, do we Google and find somebody's blog and read their blog article? Or how, even occasionally, how often do we Google and find our own blog article and go, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, so, we need to be talking to the people that actually use this stuff. Find people, talk to people. Ask people in the place you work. Look for somebody who might have a yellow screen. I have a yellow filter normally on my screen because it reduces blue light. Because if I don't, I get a migraine after a full day at work. Some people might have other colour filters which can indicate either colour vision deficiency, or it can indicate dyslexia. Don't make a big issue about it, but maybe just side up to them and go, I don't your screen. Would you be okay telling me about it? I want to understand, how can I help you? What can I do to make your life easier? Build a network. And honestly, within our Microsoft community, you will be surprised at how many people use accessibility tools but don't actually talk about it. Most important thing, oh, I thought, yeah, there you go. Not about us without us. That is, I don't know if you can see that, a ramp that you've got to go up a stair at the bottom and a stair at the top. That is not accessibility. 
That is accessibility designed by somebody who thinks they know what they're talking about. And there you go, not without us. Right, time for a demo. So my first demo is still within PowerPoint. How frustrating. Ash is desperately trying to make out. I can't read either of them. Yeah. There are words in there. And that colour contrast is not one I've made up. I actually took it from some web content and I will not tell you where I found it. But I took that colour contrast from some web content. I can't read that. I can barely read it squinting. And that one, the most common colour vision deficiency, which is the correct way of describing colour blindness, I'm having to learn all these terms. It's, it's an education book. A lot of colour blind people don't object to being called colour blind, because that's what they've been known as. But colour vision deficiency is kind of a better description. The most common is red-green, where they cannot tell the difference. There are other ones. Um, Blue-yellow is one that actually surprised me, because I thought there was quite a degree of difference in contrast between those. But blue-yellow is another one that I did not know about. If I drop into example on the right hand side, I sometimes see those colour contrasts when I'm on dark mode. Yeah. Dark mode? I use colour. dark mode on my phone and I tell you what, I'm going to be logging a bug with Microsoft Edge because their dark mode does not fully implement and, or certainly not on my Android phone. And yeah, spell I end up with spell a check is, if you use spell check on Android for a phone in dark mode, it, the, the, the spelling is actually in grey. So if you look at the other white box, you know the first one is normally the correct one to choose. Uh, the one I'm seeing Donna later. I know, I know I'm seeing Donna later. Um, the other thing to be aware about with things like green red is the reason I can't read that is that those colours give me migraines. Um, and with um, visual snow, you can get weird things in colours as well. The, the Microsoft Edge problem is across all Chrome-based browsers, so Chrome will have the same problem as Edge. Yeah. It probably is, but the reason I'm going to log it as a bug request for Microsoft is Microsoft actually, since they've adopted the Chromium engine, yeah. they have driven a huge amount of accessibility change in Chrome because they feed it back into the Chromium project, which then makes its way into Google Chrome. <laughs> It's brilliant. Right, accessibility checker. Down at the bottom, and you, you, you probably can't see, it says accessibility investigate. I've clicked on that, and it's opened the accessibility tab. And it's even told me, it's opened the side pane rather, and it's opened the accessibility tab. Welcome to Office, the new version. And I'm not even, on this laptop, I am not even running any of the beta rings. This is the latest release of 365. So this is live, this is general. I had that pop up in Outlook the other day about our company um, signature and the logo <laughs> being a problem and yeah. some of the, the colours you... I click next and it tells me about adding titles to my slides and the reasons why. Screen readers, set the reading order. That's the first time I've seen that. I haven't seen that until today. Genuinely, because I run this. But you come over here, and the accessibility pane, so the video that I embedded, I embedded it from YouTube, but I couldn't enforce the closed captions or subtitles. So one of the investigation things, and it's a warning, it tells me that online media 4 on slide 12, I should be using captions, which I'm now doing. I learned a brilliant tip for this. If you've got Office 365 or Microsoft 365, create a video 
upload it to Microsoft Stream, it will create a subtitle file with all the time codings on it. You, it's a plain text file. You yeah. then go through, you correct it, because let's be honest, <laughs> voice recognition isn't great, but it saves you 95% of the work. You can then upload that subtitle file to YouTube directly. Instant subtitles. Honestly, it blew my mind when I found out about that one. But the one here, hard to read text contrast. It's picked up, but this template has two areas where it's got hard to read con colour contrast. And I select it, and it, it, it would go to the slide, and it highlights what the objects are. And if I change the colour contrast, it will... There you go. Boom. One disappears when I fix it. Simple. It doesn't take any extra time really, it's just habit forming. It's just getting used to using the tools we've got. The other one that it's picked up on is checking the reading order because on the slides, the order of your content is important for screen readers. Now, I know I've actually been through all those slides and actually the reading order of the objects is exactly correct as I want it to be. I have a bit of a thing about this because I should be able to tick to say I've checked it and you can clear that off my list. But I'm not going to complain because this tool is getting better and better as we've just seen. So, and it's in Word. In Word, there is also another tool, another element. And I, I will go into Word quickly. So it's looking at the time and realising, but this is actually, this is important and I really, really do need to show this. So, review, uh, check accessibility, uh, check accessibility, options accessibility, yes, right. So, we all know The proofing, writing style, crap. Maybe you've never been in this box because quite often we don't. It's set to check your grammar and everything else. Things like capitalisation, commas after conjunctions, and stuff that I don't. Understand. Incorrect use of the word that, which is unticked by default. Missing end punctuation. So scroll all the way down. You can highlight formality in your document by default. But you scroll right to the very bottom of the list of options for grammar checking. Oh, it's actually moved up a little bit. It used to be literally the last option. It's, it has moved up into the bottom third. There is a section for inclusiveness, which means the grammar checker will check your content. So if I write a user manual and say, when the user goes in, if he clicks on this, then he does that, and he does this, and he does this. If I have got gender bias tick, and the reason it's not ticked is because this is a new laptop that I've only just set up this week. I have it ticked by default on all my others. In fact, I have all of these ticked. Sexual orientation bias. Racial bias. Gender specific language. There you go. That's the one I actually mean. Gender neutral pronouns. If I've got those ticked, it will check my content to make sure that it is inclusive language. It's not perfect. It's getting better. My main objection is the fact that it's buried. You really have to hunt for it, and if you don't know about it... I've been using Office since Office began. 
this has existed since Office 2003, and I didn't know about it until this year. So, right, aware he's got five minutes, but you know what? Come on. Come on. What are you doing? There we go. Right, so what about our business applications? Let me turn my laptop around so I can see it, because then I'll move it. We need to design things with an accessibility first mindset. It's no good adding accessibility at the end of a project, because then it is timely, it is costly, and you ain't going to do it. Because once you've built an app, going back and renaming all of your controls, all of your variables, all changing everything, you're not going to do it. You don't have time at the end of a project to tack on accessibility. We need development standards that form habits. Visual basic background, I am used to naming all of my things so that they make sense. Var, such and such, form, such and such, etc, etc. Find out what works for screen readers. It's built into Windows, you can use Narrator. We all have it. It's there, you can turn it on. Windows 11 is the most accessible operating system. It's one of the reasons I have it installed actually, I've been using it since day one. In fact, I've been using it since day one of the preview. What I loved is when I installed it on this laptop, which was a clean install, my others have all been upgrades. The default first screen that you get after you boot it up immediately highlights accessibility options and turning on, and it talks to you. It doesn't wait until you've got all the way through to the Cortana screen to actually talk to you. It talks to you straight away. Seriously. And we need to accept that one size doesn't fit all. What works for one person might exclude another person. But we need to try and build what works for our user base and make sure that we're not, ex not inadvertently excluding people and that we have conversations. So how do we do it? We learn what is possible. I'm going to put these slide decks on my blog because I am two minutes now. Microsoft Learn, honestly, there is an accessibility fundamentals course. It takes a couple of hours. It is something I strongly recommend anybody does. New recruits at Microsoft, within their first couple of weeks or so, have to do accessibility training. They basically have to do the Microsoft internal version of that. It's really interesting watching new starters at Microsoft and the first badge they post internal from Microsoft is they pass the accessibility. It's just like, oh, wow. The app A11Y project, and I learned that you actually say A11Y, it's not Ally, even though it, I like the fact it looks like Ally. It's the accessibility project. They bring in content speakers, influencers, people together to talk about how to build solutions. LinkedIn, what the, why have I put LinkedIn on there? Because if you actually go on LinkedIn and search the hashtag accessibility, search the hashtag A11Y, that one actually is brilliant. I have found some amazing people on there. This one lady, Claire, I can't remember her last name, she's blind. And she posts some mind-blowing stuff. I've been learning so much from her this past month. Put it on the agenda. If you're running workshops, you're doing project kickoffs with clients. Include accessibility. 
put it on the agenda right at the start and say, we can build this. Talk about it. If you don't know, say, I don't know, and talk about it. I'm happy to talk to anybody about this stuff. I really am. I will willingly <laughs> drop on a Teams meeting. I will meet you at places. I will talk to you. I will happily discuss and I will happily listen because I know I don't know. There's a lot I'm learning and I'm learning more every day. And include it as standard and there's that link to the government document which again, like the W3C consortium, it's lots of dry language and what have you, but it just kind of shows you that it's actually there. Um, Right, I haven't got time, so, yeah, naming conventions that work with screen readers, putting tool tips when you're developing Power Apps, and also there is a field on a control called accessible text that is separate to the tool tip. So you hover over the tool tip and say, next screen, cool. The accessible text is where you put a bit more detail that screen readers can then describe, actually, what does that mean? What do, what do you mean by next screen? Where's it going to take me? What's it going to do? I only learned about that a month ago, six weeks ago. Responsive design. We think of responsive design as websites as shrink and grow. It's more than just devices. Responsive design is important for people who might have visual deficiencies and they zoom in. I've watched somebody with visual deficiency who zooms into their screen 500%. And I'm just looking going, how the hell do you navigate that? And they are... And I'm just like, what the... How? But if we're not designing responsive things that work well, not only when we shrink devices, but when we expand the font sizes and things like that, it's a different way of thinking about design. And don't forget about colour. Really do not forget about colour. Um, I'm not going to do demo time, sorry. We are out of time. Um, do not give up because it's never going to be perfect. Forget accessibility. Whatever we build is never going to be perfect. There will always be somebody that says it doesn't do X, it doesn't do Y. Why have you done it this way? Why have you done it that way? I'd have done this, I'd have done that. Everybody has opinions. Opinions are like dot, 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 dot. Everybody has one. It's never going to be perfect, but you take the first step, you learn your habit. You then learn a new habit, that's your second step. You learn a new habit, that's your third step, and already you're further along the journey. It's all that travelling. So, I am meant to be doing a Q&A, which I, I would love to talk to people Please find me, please talk to me. There are my links again, the QR code to get. Grab me on social, grab me and talk to me. Um, I am actually in a quarter of an hour, I'm meeting with Donna Sakar and Zoe Wilson, where we are going to actually be talking about planning the accessibility for Scottish Summit in February. We're all, it's on the agenda, it is just. Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> oh, are you gate crashing? No, I'm not gate crashing. Oh, no. Not unless you're going to invite me to gate crash. No, I'm gate crash. <laughs> um, you can gate crash. You're on the uh, right, yeah. accessibility team. Cool. So, you can gate crash. Um, but, yeah, we're putting it on the agenda. It's going to be there. It, it's been there for the last few years, and it's more than just words. So, please, grab me, talk to me, speak to me. Connect with me, 
as I say, I'm happy to drop on Teams meeting, WhatsApp calls, phone calls, meet in pubs, meeting wherever, <laughs> coffee shops, whatever, and talk any day because it is important. Final nod to our wonderful sponsors, sponsors, more sponsors, lots of sponsors. And thank you all very much for attending. Please do provide feedback on the QR code um, about the session. I won't get upset if it's negative feedback because actually that uses me, that drives me forward. Um, I only know what I know that I know. If I don't know, I can't improve. So thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. I hope this has been useful. And enjoy. The pub quiz, if you go into the pub quiz, because I think we're. Is this the last session of the day, or is there one at five? Oh, there's Keith oh, Watling. Oh, oh, there's Keith. Oh, there's Keith's closing keynote. Doing a closing keynote. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the, o the only warning if you're trying to.